Thanks, Jill. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about the press's perspective, which is a little bit like coming into the lion's den at a meeting like this. Um, first, I wanted to talk to you about uh, what ProPublica is. In case you haven't heard of ProPublica, we're based in New York, and we're an independent, nonprofit news organization that produces investigative journalism in the public interest. We were founded in 2008 um, at a time when the mainstream news media really started a precipitous decline and the, num and the amount of investigative reporting in news organizations was dropping. So we have a staff of about 40 journalists and one of the, our major mission is not to cover local news or sports or business news, but rather to uncover abuses of power and betrayals of the public trust. And we partner with um, national news organizations including the USA Today, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, NPR, PBS, and also regional organizations across the country. We make our data freely available to them and they can customize our stories for their audiences as well. Um, my colleague Tracy Weber and I have been looking at sort of the hidden areas of medicine over the course of the past uh, three to four years with two questions in mind. Um, what do drug companies pay health professionals? Why do they pay them and what do they get in return? And what doctors prescribe and how they compare to their peers? This is, both of these have been subjects of intense interest in medical journals and there have been research studies published about both of them. But I think from the perspective of patients, the one thing that they didn't really know is did this affect their physician? How did these sort of amorphous topics of what was going on impact the doctor that they were relying on for their care? Or in other cases, a different type of health professional. So what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about today is our project that launched in 2010 called Dollars for Docs. And Dollars for Docs takes the publicly available um, databases that have been um, put out by pharmaceutical companies about their payments to health professionals, and we've combined them into one easy to search database. As I mentioned, it started in 2010 with seven companies. We're now up to 15 companies that represent about 47% of the US pharmaceutical sales market and about $2 billion in disclosed payments. Um, Mary had mentioned that uh, the companies have been reporting this information, and indeed they have. Um, 14 of the 15 companies do so as a result of corporate integrity agreements with the Justice Department having paid hundreds of millions or billions of dollars uh, to settle allegations of improper marketing or paying kickbacks to physicians to prescribe their products. So the companies started reporting this information and what we noticed right from the beginning was that they were doing so in ways that would be very difficult for the public to make any sense of. They each put them on sub-sub websites within their site. And in this case with Pfizer, you had to have the first name and the last name exactly right. So Rob wouldn't pull up Robert or Steve. Stephen with a PH wouldn't pull up Stephen with a V. You couldn't look for all of the doctors in your community, for example. Um, and you'd have to click on different years to pull them all up. You couldn't do one search and see if a doctor had received a payment in 2011 or another payment in 2012. You'd have to do two separate searches, clicking on a whole lot of buttons. Um, no two companies did this alike. This is GlaxoSmithKline's, and um, they reported different information than Pfizer did. Um, but what we found was that the information was not downloadable, it wasn't searchable, it wasn't analyzable, and to expect a patient to go to the websites of uh, many different companies and find the places on the websites for this information and to even know who made their drugs, um, good luck with that. So we said we could do this better. Um, and indeed, that's why we created dollars for docs is to combine this information into one place. There are now, as I mentioned, 15 companies in the database. Uh, another company, Beringer Ingelheim, recently started disclosing and they'll be in the database. And as you know, the Sunshine Act will require that all companies report the information in a pretty uniform manner beginning next year. So the database will obviously be much more robust at that time. Uh, I agree with what everybody said, which is that there is a difference in the types of interactions that physicians um, have with industry. And I think even within this room, there may not be uniform agreement about whether or not all those interactions uh, are in the interests of uh, patients or have the same level of value from the perspective of society. Similarly, I think that within this room, there's probably some disagreement about um, what constitutes an innovation and what constitutes a patent extension and whether or not you're trying to encourage you know, both or one over the other. Uh, and that's something that, that I look forward to hearing your discussion on. We, we took the data and we did more than just put it out there for 
um, for people to look at. We also put it in context and from the perspective of looking at it for stories. So one of the first things that we did was take this information when we first published in 2010 and looked at what pharma companies had put on their websites as far as the people that they use um, as their experts for speaking and consulting. And one of the things that was almost uniform across the board is that companies said that they chose experts in their field, people who were leaders in their uh, professions. But what we found among the doctors who were the highest paid was that um, some of them didn't have board specialty certification. Many of them were not associated with academic medical centers. Many of them had not published academic research papers. Uh, and some of them had had disciplinary records, sometimes losing their licenses in states. Um, the, we wrote a story about this and talked about how, in fact, the industry at this point had not checked state disciplinary databases to look at the credentials of the people that they employed as speakers or consultants. Uh, and that has been changed as a result of that story. We also looked at um, universities across the country that were putting in place policies to govern conflicts of interest. And some of those universities had um, policies that prohibited their physicians from doing paid speaking on behalf of drug companies, Stanford, for example. But what we found was that the, comp that the universities were not um, in checking and enforcing that their policies were being followed and found examples at these institutions where um, professors were um, doing things that they weren't allowed to do. And I think one of the things that's come through transparency is that um, as things become public, universities are becoming much more aware of this and we have requests regularly from universities for this information so they can see if their, if their faculty members have been truthful with them about the extent of their relationships. Um, we also looked at the impact of um, funding on professional societies. Um, we looked at one in particular, the Heart Rhythm Society, which received about 50% of its funding from the medical and um, the pharmaceutical and medical device industry. And we looked at their tip sheets to patients and found that they left out information that was pertinent with respect to the um, drugs and devices that people who have heart rhythm irregularities may consider. And we analyzed that and had experts review that and found that it was not a balanced perspective. And in fact, it was tilted in favor of industry. This is just a graphic of what we did uh, in which people could look at the various types of things that uh, industry could sponsor at the conference for the Heart Rhythm Society and click on things and see how much different companies paid for those. For example, what's highlighted here is shuttle bus ads and how $162,000 uh, was raised at the Heart Rhythm Society convention 2010 conference from um, the ads on the sides of buses. And you could click on various things throughout the, um, the slide to see how much was paid for those things. Um, specifically, what we found was that doctors uh, were receiving extensive amounts of money. I think probably what most people in this room are talking about when it comes to industry academic collaboration is the research or research consulting activities that will produce groundbreaking innovations and advances in science. What we found was that a lot of doctors received the bulk of their money for giving um, paid promotional talks on behalf of companies and that these folks did not um, have any sort of leadership positions. In fact, prominent leaders in their field didn't know who they were, but they were receiving a significant amount of money, in this case $730,000. Another physician uh, who was the first physician in our database this year to crack a million dollars in um, speaking and consulting, mostly speaking, $900,000 of it was from speaking. That's just over the course of the past four years, and not all of the companies in the database have disclosed for that entire period. Uh, and in fact, this uh, gentleman also does speaking for other companies that have not yet disclosed. So I wanted to show you how we present this information to the public so that they can understand the relationships as well as um, how the companies describe them. So you can begin here by just putting in a search. And in this case, I put in Duke University. And you can see the results that come up. And in some cases, you see um, the university. In other cases, you see the name of a clinician with a payee being the university. And you see the company, the year, the category, and the amount. When you click on um, one of those to look at more detail, what you'll see is this is an example of Duke University, and this is a, um, a payment detail page. And you see important notes. And we include a note on there that research payments are distinct from speaking and consulting, and that the figure listed does not reflect the actual compensation received by the physician listed as the principal investigator, and some additional details as well. So uh, I think one of the things that we did is took pains to differentiate the different types of activities um, that people may have uh, and how they're different and how research is different from other activities. 
Additionally, we allow folks to, uh, as and this is a case where somebody was paid for giving a promotional talk, we allow folks to hover over and they see the company's definition itself for the company, how they define this activity, and the context and the value that they ascribe to the activity. We also have links on all the company pages to their individual pages where they give descriptions of what they do uh, and why they do it. Most patients don't know who makes the drugs that they take. So one of the things we thought was important on these payment disclosure pages was to have the notable drugs made by each of the companies as well as links to the NIH website where people could get impartial information about those drugs. So in this case, um, you could see whether your drug was one of the drugs uh, that was made by the company that had paid your practitioner um, for activities on their behalf. Another thing we added it was at the bottom of each payment page, you were able to click to get a checklist of things that you may want to go through with your physician. So on every payment page, which is 2 million payments in our database, you get a customized page that looks something like this. That includes information about the payment. It includes a QR code that the physician can take a picture of in order to get to the page on the website that includes the payment. And then it includes some questions and things to keep in consideration. I think one of the things that we felt was most important is that, phys is that patients may approach this and say, I have this information, now what am I supposed to do with it? Right? So information that's just sort of sitting out there. So we suggest some questions that we ran by experts um, to help uh, with that conversation. So what are the specific circumstances of this payment? What is your current relationship with this company? What drugs have you prescribed me that are manufactured by companies you've taken payments from? Are there non-drug alternatives that, I'm, that I may want to consider first? Are there less expensive generic alternatives to the drugs you have prescribed? So I think one of the things we found really important for us was that we do provide context. But we don't provide context. We don't consider context to be sort of being either um, supportive of um, these relationships or opposed to these relationships, but rather to provide information to allow folks to have more informed decisions with their clinicians. We also have a page of caveats about the data because the data is pretty messy. And you know, the companies are disclosing information, spelling doctors' names wrong, um, getting cities and states wrong. Uh, AstraZeneca listed one um, meal to a doctor who lived in Don't Know, California. Valiant included payments to doctors in anywhere Illinois. Um, and one company listed a payment to a doctor just as Jennifer A. So uh, I think that we're still in the infancy as far as uh, this information and the accuracy of this information. Um, but having it out there is causing um, companies to, I think, make sure that, take pains to make sure it's accurate. Um, I think one of the things that we've done is created a national conversation on this. Uh, so while the New York Times is a national newspaper, I think our data and database and sharing the data with reporters has led to 125 different local stories based on our data, oftentimes on the front page or at the top of the newscast. Um, we share our data with um, reporters and others who are interested, and we've also created what's called a widget, which is a small box that people can put on their own websites with their stories that will allow their readers or users to access the data directly from their website without having to go to our website. It's been viewed more than 5 million times. Uh, and every day is, is, you know, gets another chunk of, of traffic. I think people are interested in this. But I think one of the things that's been interesting for us is that what you have is a group of patients who are interested in this, who had questions about their physicians. And as they look at this information, it may confirm the questions that they had about their physician. And they may choose to talk to their physician or find another doctor. And you have a whole lot of patients that don't really care about this. And that's great, too. They don't, they trust their physicians. They trust them to make the decisions that are appropriate for them. And we're not trying to undermine that trust. I think each patient needs to make a decision for himself or herself about how interested he or she is in this information and um, whether or not it's worth a conversation with their physician about it. Uh, the other thing that we've just launched is a, uh, another project called the Prescribers, in which we put in a request with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for data on the prescriptions that uh, health providers across the country have made in the Medicare Part D program, which is Medicare's prescription drug benefit. And so for the first time, we um, acquired information about prescribing patterns to 35 million Americans and made that accessible to the public in a way where they can look up their physicians or other health providers in this database to see their prescribing. Because I think what people have said in this room is right, that the financial relationships are only one part of the story. I think another part of the story is the way that the 
clinician practices medicine? Are they prescribing drugs in a way that's, uh, that's reasonable, in a way that's consistent with uh, the accepted standards in their field? I don't think that patients right now have the resources or tools at their disposal to to know whether or not that's the case. They, they explicitly trust their physicians. And so I think making that information available and in time when the information is uh, released by CMS under the Sunshine Act, being able to link up um, whether or not people are receiving payments for specific drugs and whether they're prescribing them in ways that differ from their peers, that's going to be very valuable information that will be useful in terms of having a public discussion. So I hope to keep the conversation going both up here and afterward, and my contact information is up here. Thank you.